I'm so happy to be here to be at Western. This is uh, where I think this is the environment in which I developed as an academic, uh, developed as a person, and I know you are all doing the same. It's a great place to be and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, what I thought I was going to do, uh, I understand this is International uh, Law Week, and I was going to situate uh, my talk, which is a little about, about the management of protest and the issues in which uh, protest raise uh, civil liberties questions in, on the premise that uh, protests are here to stay and they will, uh, they will continue to, uh, uh, to be part of the, the landscape. And one of the issues that has affected, and I'm going to talk a lot obviously about the, the G20 for particular reasons that I'll describe, but uh, there is an, uh, the idea that maybe uh, there's a model of policing that comes with management of international events. And I will talk a little bit about uh, this, this idea. So the themes for me today will be uh, about, certainly in, in my submissions, uh, we really do have a fairly fragile uh, understanding of freedom of peaceful assembly. We really have, uh, uh, I was saying that during the fireside stretch, we, we live in, particularly in Canada, and I've been at the CCLA now for uh, close to three years, and my sense is that although we love our charter, we really love peace, order, and good government. Particularly peace, order, and good government. Because, and I, you know, the Hugh Siegel used to make this joke that, you know, peace, order, and good government, we got two out of three ain't bad, you know. But uh, I, I think the, 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 the link between, and the tolerance for disorder is very low. And, and, and I think I will talk a little bit about how that transform itself into policing tactics, uh, media tactics, so media reactions, and, and certainly in terms of a real governance uh, issue. So, yeah, I, so in my view, we have a fairly fragile, and even on a legal standpoint, if you kind of do a little uh, research on the freedom of peaceful assembly, there's not that much written on it. It usually is blended in freedom of expression only. So, uh, my theme will also be about the law stability of engaging in democratic discussions about policing and security. The G20 is a good example of this because you, you will have, you know, uh, over a billion dollars that it was going to cost, uh, you know, 75% of that, close to 800, uh, 75 to 80% of that was security cost. And, you know, Canadians said, vraiment? That much? Is it really that expensive? Okay, you know, the, the sort of, uh, and nobody, uh, there was a, a really a, an inability to challenge uh, uh, the assessment that security A does cost that much and B does demand that much powers. And I, I will talk a little bit about that, particularly in the context of the Public Works Protection Act. And, uh, Weak accountability for policing, I, I mean, I think this has been a, a, a recurrent problem in, in Canada. We still ha have in front of the House uh, a, a, a bill to uh, amend uh, the framework of accountability for the RCMP. It hasn't passed. This has been an ongoing issue, and I'll talk about the hard work that it demands on the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, among others, uh, to try to bring uh, accountability. And I, you know, so I situate that, you know, in a larger context of the changing uh, reactions toward uh, risk management. Uh, and finally, I think, talk about are international events special in terms of the law surrounding them, in terms of the tolerance or intolerance of protest, or are they, uh, or are they something, uh, or are they finally not, not so special? Uh, a word maybe about the Canadian Civil Liberties Association before I, I go too far. It's uh, an NGO, uh, not funded, uh, funded by uh, viewers like you, <laughs> uh, funded essentially by membership and, and uh, some grants, so it doesn't accept money from the government. It has existed since 1964 
And my predecessor who really uh, put the association on the map was Alan Borovoy. He was there for 41 years. Um, and um, essentially, I had been you know, at the association for you know, about six months when the, the question of what uh, the G20 was going to arrive in Toronto, what's the role of an NGO that is dedicated, whose mandate is protection of constitutional guarantee, freedom of expression, equality, uh, uh, police accountability, and so on. What's its mandate and what should it do in this? So my talk will be not only about what happened, what are the legal questions that it raises, but what if you're serious about civil liberties, I'll talk a little bit about the strategy of an NGO. What do we do? What did we do? What were the consequences of, of what we did? Um, so uh, the, all of these pictures throughout are uh, pictures that were taken by our monitors. Uh, this is one of the things we decided to do was to organize 50 volunteer monitors uh, that were there during the entire time. They had to be neutral. If they wanted to, to, you know, to, uh, to march, you can't be a volunteer for CCLA if you want. You have to be neutral. You have to be willing to uh, assess the situation from both sides. And, and uh, so we had 50 people, law students, lawyers, retired teachers, uh, uh, you, know, you name it, that we had trained uh, to go uh, and uh, uh, witness, bear witness to what was going on. I expected that this was going to be a fairly casual affair, you know, in a way. Uh, the Toronto police had treated uh, different protests in the past, not in, a, not in a particularly nasty way. I come from Montreal where uh, the, the Montreal police uh, has a different reputation, uh, but certainly I think the Toronto police, for example, had really uh, been uh, quite uh, tolerant in the Tamil protest that had arisen just you know, six months before. So I have to say, I did not expect uh, to see what we saw. Uh, and I'd start a little bit with, this is the first recommendation of adapting to protest uh, from uh, the Her Majesty's Chief Inspectorate Constabulary, which is, you know, obviously a British uh, uh, public inquiry that took place after uh, the G20 in London, England, when one protester was, was killed. And one, the reason why I put this one first is that it's interesting that the first recommendation is a recognition of the obligation for the police that they have an obligation to facilitate peaceful, the right to peaceful assembly. They cannot just say it's a nuisance. You know, it would be so much better if they were less protesters or if they approach it from the point of view that uh, this is an inconvenience. Now, their obligation is supposed to be to, to protect everyone, including the protesters and their, their constitutional right. And I think what was interesting in the, in the British report is the fact that if they start from a different premise, if they start from a premise that indeed it is not, uh, it, it is a nuisance to have protest movements, then I think things will go askew. And uh, so it's a question of messaging, it's a question of leadership from the force, it's a question of certainly institutional practices, training, and so on, but it's, it really is a question of values as well. And uh, so, I, it, so we did bring uh, this nice report in our first meeting with uh, the uh, Integrated Security Unit uh, to share with them some of our concerns. Uh, legally, what's, what, who is responsible? So this is the act that kind of governs the, the, the framework for uh, in, international uh, events taking place in Canada. And you know, the primary responsibility is for, uh, for the RCMP. What you see here is their duty, obviously, to ensure the protection of the dignitaries that, that will come. And the key words are that they can do, they can take appropriate measures, this is subsection two, uh, they, so they can take appropriate measures including limiting, limiting access of certain areas in, you know, in light of, and their duty is to be reasonable in the circumstances. Uh, 
Uh, and so we will come back a little bit about what who decides what's reasonable in the circumstance and what's the, the framework around, around them. And, uh, and I highlight as, as well subsection 3 because that is the ambiguity in the law in Canada about exactly what powers do uh, police officers have, where do they come from, and that will explain a little bit why uh, Chief Blair, who was the, tr the chief of the Toronto Police, sought to increase the powers of the Toronto Police during the G20 through the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Public Works Protection Act. So the powers are the powers that they possess at common law, whatever that is, and under the criminal code. And the criminal code has, you know, breach of peace powers, but also the riot and illegal assembly. But all of these provisions are very old, designed in a different times, a, a pre-charter uh, pre times, and really their, uh, you know, their, their limits are, are badly understood. So I'll talk a little bit about the preparation for the G20, I'll talk about what went on, and you know, when things go askew, as they did, what do you do after? You know, how do we bring this to light? And what's you know, how how bad is it? And how complex it is to try to to uh, bring accountability uh, to this? And what's the what can we expect will happen for the future? So just very briefly, uh, so we met with the you know, if you're an NGO and you're going to have uh, your little 50 monitors. Obviously, you go and meet with the police ahead of time and you, we shared our concerns that were based on looking at what happened at Pittsburgh, elsewhere in Canada. So we shared all our good research and also we advised the police that we're going to have uh, monitors that are going to have a little white cap and a little white shirt with you know, Canadian civil liberties written on it and that they're going to be circulating. And at that time, I wanted my monitors to be protected, that is, if they, that, that they would be able to exit uh, if something was, was going askew. Uh, that was refused. But, uh, and at that time, what we wanted from the police as well, which was interesting, because the other theme here is also that the management of protest is now also becoming more and more technological. There are more and more new forms of, of, of instruments that are being deployed. And at that time, the, we had just found out that the Toronto Police had just bought uh, three uh, uh, sonic cannon, that, that they are uh, um, you know, long range acoustic devices. And the, the law in Ontario is that if, uh, under the Police Services Act, if you, uh, if the, the police cannot buy equipment that is weapon, unless it has been tested and approved by the ministry. Uh, certainly I think the, the sonic cannons have not been tested, they've just been bought the week before. Okay. So, um, so in Vancouver for the Olympics, there the RCMP had agreed to disable the alert function of the of the sonic cannon. The sonic cannon works this way: it's a super duper megaphone that can uh, uh, project pre-recorded messages, but it also has an alert function that emits a very strident noise that, in our submissions, could affect the hearing of passerby, of police officers, and so on. So anyway, we wanted that alert functions disabled, as the RCMP had done during the Olympics. That was rejected. So based on that rejection, we went to seek an injunction, saying this sonic cannon has not been tested. In our view, the alert function has the potential to be used as a weapon, because, you know, you put it to inflict pain and then to elicit behavior that you want. And that's the definition of a weapon under the, the you know. Uh, so this possibility of inflicting pain, in our view, should, should mandate that the, the sonic cannon be tested before it be deployed on the general public. And we went in front of Justice Brown, who found indeed that uh, there was a likelihood of, of, uh, 
of damage to the health and therefore oblige the TPS to have different protocols of use for the sonic cannon. The experience though, what, what was interesting is that certainly as we were engaged in this injunction, what we found out is that the Toronto Police was testing the sonic cannon as we were going through the, the process. So if I were cross-examined on Monday, on Tuesday they would arrive with a, a different protocol of use that they had on the Friday before because they had just tested the sonic cannon at the, at the airport to see how far it could go and what were the, the decibel level and, and so on. They had not tested the, the machine outside of relying on the manufacturer's guarantee and, and they had never tested it in an urban setting. So that was a bit problematic actually, not so much from the fact of whether we we're going to win or not in terms of, of the injunction, but the, to recognize that the they had been told that they had to buy this or you know obviously the budget was there so they were going to to take advantage of this but the idea was that again you know a lack of assessment the normal you know in a democracy you expect that before people you know uh, uh, police force buy uh, new technology that there would be an assessment of the risks the benefits the sonic cannon was invented and created for to deter pirates from attacking ships. It's been used in the desert. Some municipalities, now some police forces and municipalities don't use it anymore in urban setting because the sound doesn't carry the, in the same way and so on. So was it a good investment? But there was no time and no ability to, to have this discussion. The police hid behind the fact that this is operations. We decide, we're the experts, we decide the Pittsburgh police had them, we want them. Okay, so there is this idea that the model that was used in Pittsburgh or was used elsewhere had to be redeployed in Canada. It was an international event, therefore policing as understood at the international level in the US had to be transmitted. Our position was, you know, when you arrive in Canada to do an international uh, event, you're going to have to uh, probably uh, taste maple syrup, you're going to have to, you know, to do the way the Canadian, the, the way people behave, and you have to abide Canadian law. And too bad we have a, a, a framework to assess what type of, of, uh, of um, of tools the police can deploy, and that was the b debate, you know. So uh, uh, just to finish on the sonic cannon, uh, good news, okay, that was, you know, uh, 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 is that indeed uh, after the, the G20, the, we abandoned our, our, uh, our, uh, our injunction um, that to, to get a permanent injunction, and on the basis that we're going to seek from the minister and impartial evaluation of the, the sonic cannon. This evaluation has been done. Indeed, the sonic cannon, the recommendation is it does have the potential to cause harm, uh, uh, even used as prescribed by the manufacturer, and it should be regulated. Our incentive here is that we had just done taser. Okay, we, ju we just been through the taser problem you know, wasn't there a way in which we should weigh, you know, assess, test the machines before deploying them. So uh, now, you know, we suspect that based on this report, there will be a, a regulations of, of sonic cannons uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, but at least the, the process, anyway, the process seems to be on the way for it to be done. The, uh, you know, the famous fences, the way in which the as you saw in, in, in the act, the RCMP can secure an, uh, an area and prevent access or limit access. Uh, interestingly, if you remember the APEC report which uh, occurred uh, was kind of a public inquiry after uh, people were pepper sprayed at the UBC campus. Uh, Ted Hughes in that report says the, the protesters have the right to be seen and to be heard. They don't have the right to distur uh, disturb the meeting, but there is no such thing as a right to a politicians to a retreat-like atmosphere. This 
uh, report is completely ignored in the context of the G20. No way, no way any of the approved routes got even close to the fence. And you know, the meeting, you could not you know, see uh, at all what was going on uh, ever. So no way there was going to be somebody that was going to be able to wave to Obama. You know, like uh, it, the, 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 what was told to the protest movement was if you gather at the free speech zone, which is Queen's Park, they changed the name eventually after we told them Canada is a free speech zone, you know, you can't just, so, uh, so, uh, um, so they changed the name after that, it was the gathering place. They, there was going to be some, some uh, features, some, some uh, cameras and videos where that were going to be reproduced inside and therefore the, the, the leaders of the, the world could see the, the, the protesters. So, but there was no, so this, this idea, this, the Ted Hughes report is like, uh, was indeed a bit forgotten in, in, in that context. And there's a case, Tremblay versus Quebec, which was brought, an injunction that was brought around the time of the, uh, in the city of Quebec when there were the, the, the meetings there in the, the, where Monsieur Tremblay was trying to debate the size of the fence in the downtown Quebec. Uh, the court did say it's a, an infringement of freedom of religion, but it is reasonable in the circumstances according to the act. It's no way they were going to tell the RCMP to move the fence you know, two days before the meeting. In the context of the G20, we did not know what was going to be the size of the fence until quite late, until May, uh, and, and you know, which prevented a little bit an assessment of the, and, but we decided not to go after the size of the fence and focus on the sonic cannon as a strategy. But uh, certainly I think the, 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 the fence became a, a symbol. Pretty much every you know, uh, protest, the labor movement was very well organized at all as marshals that were telling people how to turn. If you know a bit Toronto, the marches typically were leave from Queen's Park, go down south all the way to Queen's and then had to turn and go to Spadina and then come back to Queen's Park. Now the fence was at Front Street, you know, which is quite a bit away. There's two or three streets there and Essentially, there no doubt there were lots of protesters that wanted to go and shake that fence, put their banner on it, or you know, do something really radical like this, and uh, and and try to climb it maybe, uh, and and so the but the the massive police presence was to protect the fence. Eventually, when you know you talk to the police about this, they will describe this as the, there was no security breach because there was nobody that approached the fence. So the fence become the definition of what is security. Nobody approaching the fence is deemed as, to, as being what is protecting security in that sense. It's a very, it's, you know, it's a reconfiguration of what security means. Anyway, I'm going to go a little bit more quickly here. So, um, many people have said, was the model of policing that was imposed on Toronto, what, does, does it come from uh, the US? Is it the Miami Protocol? Okay? Is it this new way in which uh, uh, policing must be done? And when you read a little bit about the Miami Protocol, I think you find some, some uh, aspects of it that look very much with the strategy that we, see, that we saw, that we seem to, see, to be seeing in the context of Toronto, which is, uh, not only is there preparation with technology, uh, you know, new techniques uh, being developed, but there is this communication strategy that goes with the preparation. And the communication strategy is very much one that demonizes a little bit the protest movement. You know, the protesters are dangerous, the anarchists are there, uh, they're unpredictable, they are, um, you know, be afraid, be really afraid, you know. And, and you know, so much so that, you know, U of T closed uh, and many of the residences of uh, the U of T campus were being uh, used by the police to, you know, there were police officers coming from all across Canada and many stayed in the residences except the graduate residence, which as you will see will be a, a major site of, uh, of, uh, of police abuse in, in our, you know, I think it's been recognized now, it's, uh, but uh, uh, 
The, the message was also, you know, there were 40,000 people that were caught within the fence, that worked or lived within that fence, and, uh, and they were told to dress down. You know, don't wear your trippy suit, you know, you will be accommodated, you will be harassed by the protesters. You know, eventually we laughed about this, we said don't dress down too much, otherwise you'll get arrested, you know, but, <laughs> uh, uh, but, so, but, the, the, but you see how the message was framed. The message was, you know, people, the police would come and it's, tell people to evacuate some restaurants. The protesters are coming, it's dangerous. So this framework around the idea that the protester is inherently a dangerous person, I think is now, in, you know, is very much part of the consciousness of the public. And you know, we certainly uh, heard it from uh, while we were doing the the, the monitoring. So, uh, and I, indeed, what it does is that it creates the, the the acceptability of police abuse that normally would never be accepted. I mean, you will see some of the things that happen. I don't think people want police officers to behave this way generally. But in this context of this fear of of you know the presence of the potential danger right there. Uh, the, you know, the police chief was saying the city is being invaded by uh, the protesters and so on. So the, a very uh, a, a discourse of hate and uh, uh, around this. So uh, so I've talked a little bit about the Sonic Canada. I won't talk about this, but I mean, honestly, for me, like the turning point, and and maybe I'll. I'll uh, we started it, our monitoring program. If you remember, there were some. Uh, there were some protests starting the Monday all the way to the, the famous weekend, where the famous weekend was in Toronto. The leaders who had been uh, in uh, uh, north of Toronto in the, 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 the area were moving to this, the downtown for the weekend. But during the, the, the week, there were all sorts of protest movement. And, uh, the, on Thursday was the Indigenous March, uh, there were some women's marches and so on. So, uh, fairly, most of them, I, mean, I was there, I did my tour of duty, uh, most of the time, uh, not only were the, the marches very peaceful, there were lots of police officers. There was, the presence was overwhelming, you had a bit of a sense of waste, I have to say, as a uh, um, you know, I saw nine police officers surrounding one guy to open his knapsack and, and uh, remove his water bottle. Um, you know, you feel, but Jesus, it's expensive proposition here. Uh, you know, but nevertheless, they were, you know, things were relatively smooth. Now, we saw illegal searches going on throughout, but we didn't see any uh, obvious uh, aggressions outside of the illegal searches. Uh, what we did see, though, uh, is and then on Thursday night, we had done and you know we had done a Know Your Rights Guide to Protesters, which we do a, you know we there's several editions of this you know BCCLA has one and so on, which we had sent to the police you know to tell them you know uh, essentially this is what we're going to tell the protests that they can they have the right to do, and the you know the lawyer for the the Toronto police was there and I a very w wonderful woman uh, you know I give it to her and I you know I say that's what we're telling you know so they never told us that in the meantime what they had done on May 12 Chief Blair went to the to the cabinet and said I think I need for extra precaution now that we have we've obtained the, the letter that he sent to the minister for extra, uh, for abundance of caution we would like to have extra powers and the really cute scheme that was uh, invented was to uh, designate as public works the area around the fence. The f it's in actually technically it's inside the fence, it's the sidewalks inside the fence and the Public Works Protection Act, so anyway on Thursday night I'm in the office, you know we're gathering all our monitors, nothing seems to be happening that's too crazy, you know blah blah blah. One guy calls us to say I just been uh, you know arrested and detained and uh, when I, I use your know your guides you know guide that says that you know police don't have the the right to uh, search unless they have good reasons and the, the police officers responded to me that he had all the powers under the Public Works Protection Act so you know this guy was angry with us because he was telling us that our 
our information was in a inaccurate you know so um, so I sit down and we uh, go and try to find out this Public Works Protection Act and went on e-laws and discovered that indeed they had been a uh, the Public Works Protection Act exists since 1939 it has not it has been amended two or three times to uh, make the, the, the language gender neutral and to increase the penalty from you know uh, $100 to $200 or something like that. But on, and there were no regulations under the Public Works Protection Act until uh, May uh, 2010, where there is a regulation on, published under ELAWS that says that there's a de designation for uh, the week. Uh, of, uh, of the G20 of the area as being a public works. The Public Works Protection Act, essentially, it's a war type crime, you know, I mean, now that I've done all the research on it, I read all the, the report, the answered at the time of its passing, and it was passed in two days, just as the, the war was, you know, arising in September 1939, it, the, th the three readings occurred, there was not an amendment and so on, you know. And the, the Lieutenant General thank the, the, the members of the Parliament for the speediness at which they responded to the crisis facing Ontario. And what it does, it gives the power to police officer or security uh, personnel to arrest detain, search anyone who approaches a public works. And uh, public works is defined very largely. It could include any public building, so it could include a municipal building, could include a, an arena uh, uh, or, or anything like this. So typically, th theoretically, if it was applied as it's written, police officer could stop you anytime you try to take your kids to the, to, uh, to the rink and say, what is the purpose of your visit? And please open your bag. Now obviously police officers don't do that. Uh, nobody interprets the, the act in this way. It would be unconstitutional. So on its face, um, and what was more problematic is that they did that in the context are not disclosing to any, anybody. You know, it was a secret, they passed that on e-laws. Now from now on I think you should read electronic news every night to see what has happened today. But, you know, so essentially passing the description for 10 days without uh, not only letting the public know so the information that was distributed to protesters were certainly incorrect. We had done our Know Your gri gu Rights Guide based on the law as we understood it, not knowing about this secret regulation. And uh, to me, like I still cannot understand what was the public interest in not letting people know what their rights were going to be. You know? But uh, and certainly, I think the ombudsman has validated our position, and so has Roy McMurtry. This week, uh, the Public Works Protection Act has been announced, will be repealed and, and replaced. So, uh, nevertheless, the point uh, to go back to the lack of democratic engagement, you know, what is this? This is you have a very charismatic police officer that comes and say, you know, I'm worried that I don't have enough powers. This is a big event. Please give me some. And people say, oh, okay. You know, I mean, it, it, I mean, there there would be lawyers within the department, the attorney generals uh, of Ontario that would have had to look at this. Uh, you know, there was no no reaction, no appetite, no ability to say, wait a second. You know, so I think we've lost a little bit the ca the capacity to challenge a security assessment from the expert. I mean, they're the expert; they must know what's needed. You know, so and I think that's that's kind of starting to be problematic. So anyway, you know, going very quickly, uh, so, uh, um, you know, what happened that day? So I talked a little bit about the Monday. So certainly I think on Thursday night, <laughs> when we saw that, then we called the, the Globe and we called the Toronto Star, you know. If you discovered that indeed there's some secret uh, 
uh, regulations passing. The next morning, uh, Chief Blair, does, it's a very convoluted language that they use in the regulations, so Chief Blair made a mistake talking about, you know, uh, that police officers could arrest around, you know, uh, around the fence. The Premier is, is debating this. Anyway, for the entire weekend, there's some, some difficulty of understanding exactly what this acts act, but certainly the police officers that we saw understood that, and they took from that the message that they could do, they could arrest, detain, and ask for identification anywhere, nowhere close to the fence. You know, uh, all over the city, they were arresting people and and detaining them. Now, the Saturday uh, was quite clear that this was going to be the uh, the the day of where there was going to be lots of, of difficulty. So, the, when the vandalism and the you know the the rock throwing and the police car burning occurred and in Toronto you have to see the, the protest was going down uh, university turning on Queen and then the black bloc emerged from the protest and went east and there you know there's a car burning right at the corner there and some disturbance and basically they are they go on without being stopped and that's has turned out to be an issue. You know, there's no police officers that are going or interrupting the rampage that's starting from Queen all the way up young on college and so on. There's some debate now as to why not. You know, uh, there's no constitutional right to throw a rock in the window. You know, so if somebody is is indeed. Uh, 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 you know, why not? Why wasn't there, a, 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 you know, a, the police? And now, you know, some of the internal police documents say that there was some bad communications. They were told to protect the fence, uh, and they were, and they thought it was a diversion. Or anyway, it's still unclear, and we're still waiting, obviously, from further reports. Uh, uh, there's two, two or three reports that are still outstanding. Immediately after, around four o'clock. This is when the, the reactions on the crowd start from the police point of view and from our point of view. At Queen's Park arrive the horses. The, you know, the, the grabbing of, of people, that's where Adam Nobody will be beaten up. Uh, that's where, you know, the, the uh, Mr. Uh, Pine, the guy that had an artificial leg, will be yanked out and, and, uh, and, and left. He was, that was the meeting place, so people were s coming back, sitting down, waiting for, for Mr. Pine. I, and I encourage you, if you're interested in the small li little human elements of this, we did some public hearings eventually uh, uh, on this, and Mr. Pine tells the story. His daughter is in environmental studies, and she's in the protest and sitting there waiting for him. And then is is yanked and treated quite quite harshly uh, by the police. Um, essentially, I think the the tone change. You know, it's a change of tone. Then you know, it really is the unleashing of 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 police force on the crowd. So then there's so there's a charging of the crowd at Queen's Park. We will have it the same at Esplanade. Rubber bullets at Esplanade. Uh, some people and then starts the 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 technique of kettling. Kettling is when the police come and encircle the protest movement, push, 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 and then they arrest everybody. Normally, the Kettling policy of the Toronto Police was that you're supposed to let people out if they're not going, you know, if they're willing to leave. They didn't do that, wh whatever the reason. Now, the Toronto Police has says they will no longer use the Kettling policy. At international, in internationally, uh, it has been quite debating as to whether it's an appropriate technique or whether indeed by pressuring the crowd, obviously I, I can tell you we have people calling us before their cell phone were seized in panic. You know, people are pressed against each other. Uh, some people have panic attacks and so on. It's quite scary. We had, you know, two on the Saturday night, we had two of our monitors that were caught in the kettling that were arrested. They arrested everybody, put everybody at the detention center. You know, everybody, all our monitors had to call in every hour to tell us what was going on, da da da. They, uh, they called to say they're, you know, they're in the crowd, they can't get out. 
you know, I said, so I called the Tr Toronto police saying, you know, obviously they made a mistake. You know, they have the little white hat, the little white, you know, Cecilia. <laughs> uh, no response. It's complete chaos at the detention center. So although it was very sad and I feel very bad for these volunteer monitors, it turned out to be very good for CCLA because then we had inside information about the detention center. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so on the Sunday morning, so throughout the night there will be some different arrests. There's all sorts of funny stories that, uh, and not so funny stories about these arrests. And then on Sunday morning, you have the mass arrest of the people coming from the bus from Montreal, who are all arrested at Graduate House in their PJs, they're, you know, they're sleeping, the police come in with the taser guns and arrest them all. Uh, no warrants, and eventually all these charges will be withdrawn because of the lack of warrant. Uh, there is also, the, you know, so we had, we had the monitors uh, uh, to witness, we were at the Graduate Building, not inside, on the outside, and then I, we had monitors also at the detention, in front of the detention center. And this, you know, I just, the, the crowd actually had negotiated with some of the police officers that were there that they were, you know, the police officer says, don't cross the road, okay? You can stay on this side, but you cannot cross. The detention center is this, you cannot cross it. And, you know, about five minutes later, unmarked vehicle came and start you know, shooting rubber bullets and, and, and dispersing the crowd. And it was, again, a, quite a, a scary atmosphere. Uh, in the afternoon, you know, you, many of you probably have read, have seen uh, Officer Bubbles' uh, YouTube video. If not, I encourage you to, to do it. Uh, and then at Queen and Spadina, again, another kettling. Three hours in the rain. Three of our monitors will be arrested in that one. And this is where we got lots of people calling us. The people, you know, people were being caught that were carrying their groceries with their, you know, with their dogs, and a real sense of, of fear emerging from this. So quite. So at the end of the day, we, you know, and you know, detention center was absolutely, you know, no, no right to a lawyer. People had their hands tied for the entire period. Uh, no phone, no shoes. Uh, the, they were given every so often sandwiches and water. It was there were garbage everywhere. There's a lot of reported incidents of abuses. Certainly, I think we, you know, uh, you know, the, the language that was being used very much a language. Not every, not all police officers were like this, but some some of them really engaging in in uh, the demeaning of the, the of the protester. You know, uh, no matter what they uh, people were being released uh, on the conditions that they would not protest again. Okay. And this, I think, this, you know, one of the issues that are, for me as a lawyer was to witness, you will eventually have bail conditions that will say, you know, you are released provided you don't participate, you don't, you don't protest again. It's unconstitutional, we can't have that, you know. But there's a level of tolerance for illegality that comes in that context. And it's very hard to get at if you're a lawyer. How are you going to get at the fact that people are very happy to sign anything to get out of that detention center? You know, I will not protest ever, ever again, you know. I, and people are willing to sign anything to get out, and there's no way to challenge this illegality. So I'll tell you what we're trying to do now. But, but so overall, you know, a thousand and, you know, over a thousand, 105 people were arrested, the largest mass arrest outside of wartime. Uh, there were, you know, 103 uh, with no charges laid that were released. 714 at Beach of the Peace uh, uh, charges laid, but eventually were were released. And then um, uh, the 263 that were charged with. Uh, mischief, uh, conspiracy to commit mischief. Uh, many of them, uh, there was no basis to, 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 there was, you know, you cannot arrest massively a whole bunch of people. That's not the law in Canada, you know. You, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the, the absence of warrants and so on. So all these charges were, uh, were abandoned or withdrawn over the summer at different stages. In the meantime, though, many of them had bail conditions. I had, you know, a Quebec people that had bail conditions not to come back to Ontario. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, it, they signed this, and uh, and uh, um, so you know, there's a, a way in which there was a the policing aspect was continuing to teach a lesson, you know, to teach a lesson that engaging in protesting is dangerous, is Inappropriate, and that's not the way you should you should do it. So, um, 
and you know like uh, I'll so what's the you know eventually we found out there's a, a lots of you know there's a, a certain number of guilty pleas there's a couple of cases that are still uh, going on based on the infiltration and that's another that's a new phenomenon in the I think that I had not un understood before how many of the groups were infiltrated. Uh, and, you know, we now know that uh, the infiltrators, you know, the question is, are they actively part, what, is there a code of ethics for infiltrators? I mean, are you, uh, can you indeed uh, engage uh, forcefully in the debate about uh, tactics and so on? So this entire issue is being raised. What are we doing now? You know, and what's, what does it tell us for the future? So certainly there's, there's a class action going on, there's some individual actions. There, you know, there was a presentation at the, uh, to the Freedom of Expression Rapporteur at the International Law about this. Um, and the, there is, we, we lodge 80 complaints at the Ontario Independent Police Review Commission uh, director. There's 200 complaints at the Ontario in Independent Police Review. Um, it's not going very well. Is you know is decided to do a general review, but it's very long, very, very complex. Uh, not enough resources in the accountability to respond to this. And one of the real issue here, and I'll, I'll conclude a little bit on that so that people can ask questions. Nobody has interrupted me. I'm surprised. Uh, uh, is you know the first thing. I think this we will win. This was a joint policing effort. You know, you had police officers coming from Montreal, from Fredericton, from Calgary. You know, uh, you know the RCMP, TPS, OPP were all together, and all the, the the it was a joint policing effort that is necessary by the scope of the of the event. But what the the accountability is still piecemeal. It's still jurisdictionally bound. So what it means this is we had to lodge complaints in Quebec, in Alberta, in, in Ontario, in, you know, in New Brunswick, without knowing, you know, you, I mean, you don't, you know, we took badge numbers of some people, but when they had some, because many of them, as you know, removed their badges. Um, so all this, this framework is, is inappropriate. I mean, you cannot do large policing that is joint policing without having an accountability framework that responds to the fact that it's a joint f effort. So I think on this one, we certainly, I think for the next events and for events that are coming up, if there's joint uh, policing, the accountability must be matched with the policing strategy. You know? So I think that's not too radical a proposition. Uh, but more difficult, I think, is, um, you know, we, we ask for public inquiry, you always do ask for public inquiries in that context, and particularly for that reason, because uh, there was going to be a myriad of reports, and we thought it was going to be inefficient, and certainly uh, one place uh, would have been better. So we got nowhere with that. Uh, but, so we did our own, we did our own public inquiry, we did our own uh, uh, public hearings, not so much, I have to say, not so much because we thought, we, yeah, obviously, the, the Toronto police decided to refuse to participate. Uh, we, are, we were in the process then of asking access to information demands and so on to, to know a little bit and it takes forever to, to, to do that. But also, I think that people needed to talk about what had happened to them. Uh, you know, there was a, a sense a little bit of, uh, you know, the, it, you're, you've, it, I think people that are generally have a really many people have probably a, a, a positive image of the police had you know really lots of difficulty in what happened to them now a lot of people would say you should have expected it uh, this is the reality of policing every day there was nothing special in the way and uh, in, in which it was treated but nevertheless the scope uh, was certainly uh, something different now, so we uh, made a complaint at, uh, against the RCMP for its overall management and communication strategy. Uh, this is ongoing, and we made a complaint against CSIS for the interview, uh, but we won't know this. This is quite secret, so we won't know. Now, let me just situate this more broadly in terms of what we I see, and I, how's my time in this? We're Two minutes? Close to the end. But, okay, well, I'm just going to stop here and just, uh, um, conclude on this on the basis of this I think what what we're we're in a you know when we teach or learn criminal law uh, we move from a, a model where you know there's 
presumption of innocence, which accepts that, you know, a presumption of innocence is that, you know, it's better to, uh, uh, that there's some cost to it. You know, that somebody that is guilty will go free because of the, presum because of the principle of presumption of innocence. In this context, there's almost an unacceptability having cost to, to the freedom of peaceful assembly. If you have a, a, a peaceful assembly, on occasion, there will be rocks and windows. You know, it's, you, you cannot have rights without having some cost to them. And you know, how do you manage the cost is, is really what's this all about. It used to be evidence-based, now it's intelligence-based. It was mostly about infiltrators and, and, and so on. It used to be public trials, now very much a lot of demand for secrecy. Uh, and, and certainly I think, you know, the current law is you need an act of three. It is, you will be tried for something you are alleged to have done. But in the context of risk prevention, you are uh, arrested or you are supervised and people were, you certainly were uh, being infiltrated on the basis of what they might do, who they were, what they thought, how, you know, and that's very dangerous in a democracy because you're, there's a real chill on, public, on political participation if, you know, if you go into any uh, a public meeting and, you know, political meeting and there's likely to be police uh, infiltration there and you know you're being framed or profiled based on what you think and that's I think that's the real danger here and I will finish on on this that you know one of the issue for us is certainly I think uh, have we now moved to the fact you know like it, people just don't uh, the, the, and I'll conclude that the freedom of peaceful assembly is, uh, is important in, in a democracy, not just because it's a nice principle. Politicians need to know what their constituents are willing to stand up for. And, you know, politicians, people you would tell me, oh, well, they could just write a letter to the MP. But the freedom of peaceful assembly is, you know, is to allow a constant dialogue with the, the, the population. People are entitled to petition their government in many forms. You know, they speak to, you know, the rich people have their lobbyists. They do speak to, uh, uh, to their constituents, to lobbyists, all through their mandate. Poor people have their feet. And, and, you know, if you don't protect the right to peaceful assembly, you're depriving the polity of the ability to enrich itself from their public participation. Merci. <laughs>